Is this Ken? Yeah. Ken Wall? Yes, it yes, it was Ken Wall. I'd recognize that voice anywhere. He was Richie Gennaro from one of my favorite movies, his first movie, The Wanderers. Wall was a bright light right out of the starting block, and he followed up that promising debut alongside Paul Newman in the critically acclaimed movie Fort Apache. He also co-starred with Lee Marvin and Ernest Borgnine in the sequel to The Dirty Dozen. Wall then made the leap from the big screen to the small screen and won a Golden Globe Award for his acting on the series Wise Guy. And although he'll be the first to admit that luck plays a big part in becoming a Hollywood actor, a string of bad luck actually plagued Wall for years. One freak accident threatened to paralyze him for life. It was actually his good conditioning and upper body strength, and particularly the strength in his neck, that kept him from breaking it and becoming a paraplegic. I caught up recently with the famously private Ken Wall and was happy to hear that one of my favorite performers shares many of the same ideas that shape my own worldview. He is a good fella and not in a wise guy sense. He's wonderfully American, pragmatic, smart, and has given a lot of thought to what us conservatives need to do at this juncture in U.S. history. I got, I, we, we moved around a lot. I got bounced around a lot. Um, like I said, I, I very much admire my parents, but apparently they were too much alike, and they got divorced when I was about nine years old. And as a result of that, I got tossed around a lot. And I went to school, I, I went to 17 schools in total, in just 11 grades, and then I dropped out. But I, in, from ninth grade to 11th grade, I went to five different high schools, and every high school I went to, I was completely ostracized because I didn't do drugs. When I would go to a new school, and the guys would come up and they want to be pals with you, they offered you drugs. That was like their pizza, and I'd say, no thanks, man, you know. And I didn't care if they did it. Right. It just wasn't anything I was interested in. Well, you were an athlete. Right? You, you, yes, yes, I was, but I didn't get to play on the school teams because I had to work. Mm. Um, you know, my family was pretty poor. Do you think that your basic principles would be the same had had you grown up in a, in a household that was had more largesse? I, I don't think so. I mean, it's possible, but that's a matter of degree. I mean, how much more? You know, what, 10%, 20%? I don't know. But had I grown up wealthy, maybe... That's impossible to say. But I, I kind of don't think so because I, I felt like I was pretty well cemented in my basic values very early. And when I, when I say very early, I'm talking like seven, eight years old. I can remember kids then, you know, complaining about their parents. But I hate my mother. I hate, I, how can you say that? Don't ever say you, I mean, that was just beyond anything that I could ever say, let alone think. Was this something that was discussed openly at the dinner table? No. We were in such a survival mode all the time, there really wasn't much discussion of politics or religion or anything at the dinner table. It's, the discussion was mainly, how are we going to be able to pay for the next meal? As I, I used to say in the, the few interviews that I did, you know what, it wasn't so much that we were, we were worried about our next meal. But the one after that was in question. <laughs> Why didn't you gravitate towards uh, an entitlement mentality? Because I always craved independence and freedom, even from my parents. As much as I loved and admired them, well, number one, I didn't want to be a burden on them. Mm. So that was, and number two, I just wanted to be independent. I couldn't wait till I could go out in the world and make my own way, because I never liked being told what to do. Even though I honored my parents and did what they told me to do, I was a pretty good kid. But I didn't like it. You know, I'll do it, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. If I was able to, I would have gone out at 13, 14 years old and tried to make my own way because I just loved being independent. And I didn't want to be beholden to anyone or anything. And that includes the government. So I didn't want any entitlement. Don't help me out. I don't want charity. Um, did your parents live to see your success? Oh, yeah, they're still alive. Okay, good. No, they're both still alive and doing fine. Are they still an influence on your on your thinking? I think the tables have turned somewhat. I think I'm more of an influence on them now. Is it safe to say that they're conservative? Oh, my dad is. My, my mother's more liberal. Mm, isn't that the but case? I get into it with her pretty good. <laughs> so she's part of that uh, electoral map that, uh, in full disclosure, we've had discussions before. This isn't the first time we've talked. Right, that's correct. And... Um, we, we talked in the past about the 
the electoral maps, uh, what they would look like if you remove certain demographics from, from, from the scene. And w one of them was the woman demographic. Would you say your mother fits into that demographic somewhat? You know, that's too simplistic to just say that um, on, on certain things. But my mother was, uh, I mean, I really admire her, too, because she was quite a rebel herself. I mean, with, with no formal education of her own, she used to sit down and she had this old clackety typewriter, and she used to write letters to the editor, and she got some printed. For us, having no formal education whatsoever, that was quite an accomplishment. She would see things on the news and get pissed off about them, and she'd sit down there and she'd, she looked like one of those, like Rosalind Russell in one of those old movies, you know, when she'd have the cigarette hanging out of her mouth, clacking away on the, on the keyboard. You keep mentioning that you're, you were... Um, maybe this is the wrong turn of phrase, but you're saying ill-educated. But how does that how does that comport? Oh, I didn't say that. No. I, I said not formally. Educated. Formally educated. Okay. Um, but that doesn't comport with how articulate you are and how informed you are. Were you a reader, young? Yes. Yes. Very much so. As a matter of fact, my mother told me that I could read um, things in the newspaper at two two and a half years old. <laughs> And as a matter of fact, she just told me that recently. I never knew that until, I don't know, about six months ago. I don't even know how we got on that subject, but uh, yeah, she was saying what an early reader I was. I've always just been interested in everything that goes on. I'm one of those people that wants to know everything gratuitously. I don't need to know something for any reason other than for knowing it. The first thing I bought myself when I started making a little money was a set of Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> that was my first big purchase. There's a great scene in Serpico where uh, Al Pacino's character, Serpico, is talking about why he became a, a policeman. Because when he was a kid and there was something going on in the street, there was a circle and ring of people around an incident that he couldn't see what was going on in there. And that drove him crazy that he had this yeah. need to know what was going on in this inner circle because he was a little kid. He couldn't see over their heads. Right. Um, in, in a way, do you... Um, you sort of sympathize with that? Oh, sure. I mean, that's as good an analogy as any. I mean, there are things out there I don't know, and I want to know them. When I was growing up, I would see this, what they call now, groupthink. Hmm. That, okay, the, there's the cool guy in the gang, and he says something, and everybody else kind of goes along with it just because he said so. And... If anything, I was taught by my parents and my grandparents was that think for yourself. Well, go to school and learn how to think, but don't let them tell you what to think. And that's what I, a lot that I think is going on now. It's not knowledge, it's indoctrination. How do you explain, the, um, in, in your view, the, the disconnect with the women vote versus the men vote? What, what is inherent in a woman that, where they gravitate towards progressive ideals? And, and men do not. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, oh, sure. Well, I think just that, that, of course, not being a woman, I'm speaking <laughs> from a male point of view, but for, from everything that I've heard and seen and learned, it's basically because of reproductive rights. They have this uh, erroneous idea that the right wants to take away their reproductive rights. And that's something that's a bill of goods that's been sold to them by the left for a long time. And they've bought it. So I think that's the main thing. Even if a woman um, is pro-life, I think that if, if she has been convinced by the left that the right wants to take away her reproductive rights, even if she's not all that interested in that, that it doesn't apply to her at, 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 her, at that moment in her life, that she's going to go towards the left. Just because, like, you can't tell me what to do with my body. And that, of course, is, is the most intimate thing. And that's what I've taken away from it, that the whole idea of abortion is some, when something is growing inside your body that, as men, we, can't, we can only imagine what that's like. But that is the most intimate thing that a woman can experience, in, in my opinion, 